Madam President, dear Roberta, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to the European Parliament for all the work that has been done over the past years, but also express my um, expectation to do quite some work in the last months. We still have work to do, and I hope we can, uh, we can work together with you in the most fruitful way possible. Ladies and gentlemen, 2024 will be a crucial year. A lot is at stake for Europe, a lot is at stake for the West. A year where our democracies and our liberties will be put to the test. Not only with the election for this House, but equally so for the US Congress, equally so with an election for the American presidency. If 2024 brings us America first again, it will be more than ever Europe on its own. We should, as Europeans, not fear that prospect. We should embrace it. We should embrace it by putting Europe on a more solid footing. Stronger, more sovereign, more self-reliant. A Europe that delivers and makes a difference in people's lives. Protecting them, strengthening the economy, preparing a common European future. The Belgian presidency wants to contribute to this effort. And we are grateful that we can build on the efforts and the many successes of the Spanish presidency that just finished. Ladies and gentlemen, in spite of all the challenges we face, Europe is a good place to live, if not probably the best in the world. The euro, the internal market, and social cohesion, these are the cornerstones of our prosperity. We managed to turn the page on COVID faster than many others in the world. We achieved unity and solidarity in the face of the Russian war of aggression against an innocent Ukraine. A solidarity we absolutely need to keep up with the Ukraine facility and continued military support. For America and for other allies, the support for Ukraine is a strategic question. It is a geopolitical consideration. For us Europeans, the support to Ukraine is existential. It goes to the heart of our security and our prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the biggest challenges ahead is keeping our European economy strong and vibrant. Europe cannot become an economic museum. If we want to remain that innovative, creative, capital-rich and productive continent, we will have to switch to a higher gear. The United States of America gave its industry a giant fiscal boost, a 1.2 trillion subsidy bazooka that is make, making even the biggest European member states flinch. And on the other side, we see China strengthening its grip over world markets. The only way we Europeans would not get squeezed is to revive the spirit of the great Jacques Delors, opening up the markets of the future for European competition, energy, digital, artificial intelligence, defense, and capital markets. The problem is Europe is strong on innovation, but weak in scaling up those innovations. Our young entrepreneurs struggle today to bring their ideas to the market. They struggle finding risk capital and venture capital to grow their businesses and to conquer new markets. We need to go from invented in Europe to developed in Europe all the way to made in Europe. And to do that, we need more than just a few pockets of capital in a handful of European cities. 
We need the whole of Europe, every corner of our continent, to turn into one big capital market, accessible to all young entrepreneurs from Stockholm to Naples, from Dublin to Sofia. That is why the Belgian presidency has asked former Italian Prime Minister Enrico Letta to come with a report to give the European single market a new momentum. And we need to make a similar shift when it comes to our industry, to keep industrial investment strong, to keep industrial production here among us in Europe. For that, we need an industrial deal alongside the Green Deal. It is not only vital for our prosperity, but also crucial to win the fight against climate change. The climate policies of China and the United States contain an abundance of carrots for their industry, while we here in Europe all too often grab for the stick. By not merely fixing the climate goals, but also nailing down the way in which these goals need to be achieved. We are leaving too little room for our companies, too little room for innovation and for creativity. In order to prevail in the fight against climate change, we need a Europe with focus. To focus on bringing down green gas, gas, greenhouse gas emissions. To support companies who develop and use these clean technologies. To become more technological neutral in our policies. And let us not forget to create the necessary social support for these climate policies. By making green investments accessible to all, not just to the happy few. That is why our presidency wants to give a new impetus to our social agenda. On the initiative of the President of the European Commission, we bring together the social partners to discuss the future of social dialogue, to confront the challenges that we face, to discuss how disruptive changes in our social and economic models, such as artificial intelligence, can be best addressed. This initiative goes hand in hand with the Belgian Presidency's ambition to ensure a strong implementation of the European pillar of social rights as we prepare for the next institutional cycle. Mesdames et Messieurs, Ladies and gentlemen, une Europe qui tient sa place dans le monde de demain signifie aussi une Europe qui prend ses responsabilités par rapport à ses voisins. Les Balkans occidentaux, l'Ukraine, la Moldavie et la Géorgie. En attendant d'accueillir de nouveaux membres, ne restons pas inactifs. Pendant que, quelques, pendant que les pays candidats se préparent à l'adhésion, nous ne pouvons pas rester les bras croisés. La présidence belge s'efforcera de soutenir les pays candidats dans leur aspiration à rejoindre la famille européenne. Plus encore, nous devons assumer notre part de l'effort. Pour garantir la capacité d'action de l'Europe, Lorsque nous passerons d'une famille de 27 à une famille de plus de 30 membres. La tâche est colossale. C'est pourquoi la présidence belge souhaite établir une feuille de route. Voici les quelques domaines dans lesquels nous comptons imprimer notre marque. Le financement de l'Union, les futures priorités politiques adressées à l'échelon européen, le renforcement de notre démocratie européenne, une meilleure intégration de l'État de droit dans l'Union, pour faire en sorte que les critères de Copenhague ne soient pas seulement des conditions à l'adhésion de l'Union, mais une obligation permanente. Car le respect de l'État de droit et de la démocratie ne peut pas être un élément secondaire de notre Union. Il doit être au cœur même de sa construction. C'est pourquoi nous continuerons à appliquer la procédure de l'article 7 sous notre présidence. Il s'agit des règles les plus fondamentales du contrat social 
européen. Ainsi, nous souhaitons également que les pays candidats à l'adhésion soient impliqués dans nos dialogues de l'état de droit. Le plus tôt, ce sera le mieux. Nous devons soutenir tous les pays qui ont l'ambition de construire un état de droit fort, une démocratie solide. Et à partir de là, mener une lutte toujours plus acharnée contre la désinformation et les ingérences étrangères dans nos élections libres. En Belgique, comme dans de nombreux États de membres, des puissances étrangères tentent d'affaiblir et de mettre à mal nos processus démocratiques. Nous le constatons. La lutte pour une, union, pour une union démocratique va de pair avec une capacité de décision accrue, car c'est ce que nos citoyens et citoyennes attendent de nous. Que l'Europe agisse concrètement, qu'elle protège au quotidien et qu'elle assure leur prospérité. Si notre union c'est construite sous l'impulsion des leaders visionnaires. Elle est portée aujourd'hui par les attentes de ces citoyens. Agir concrètement pour nos citoyens, c'est ce qu'on va faire sous la c'est ce qu'on a fait sous la présidence espagnole et le Parlement européen. Et je félicite d'ailleurs pour les progrès notoires accomplis, notamment en matière de migration. Dames et messieurs, migration. Is an well, migration is a die challenge which keeps us all uh, busy. We, so we need to be honest. This is a complex question, die complex question die die which can't be solved from one day to the other. Migration is so old as the man's head itself. Ze maakt deel uit van onze geschiedenis en ze zal ook deel uitmaken van onze toekomst. Of we dat nu willen of niet. Maar wat Europa wel kan doen, is migratie beheersbaar, controleerbaar en menselijk maken voor iedereen die betrokken partij is. Een meer gecoördineerd en geïntegreerd Europees buitenlands beleid is duidelijk een deel van de oplossing. We moeten brede partnerschappen aangaan met derde landen. Samenwerken met hen op het vlak van energie, van handel, van onderwijs en van talentontwikkeling. Europa kan en moet de landen in ons nabuurschap stabieler maken. Enkel zo kunnen we op een structurele manier de verwachtingen van onze burgers in zaken migratie inlossen. Daarom ook moeten we alles in het werk stellen om het leed van onschuldige burgers in Israël en Palestina een halt toe te doen. We moeten aandringen op meer humanitaire corridors naar de Gazastrook, op veilige corridors die permanent openstaan. Het internationaal recht moet gerespecteerd worden. Europa moet Israël ook bijstaan in hun gerechtvaardigde strijd om de gijzelaars terug vrij te krijgen en in legitieme strijd tegen de terroristische organisatie Hamas. Europese inspanningen om het lijden te stoppen van zowel Israëli's als Palestijnen, die zijn niet onverenigd. Integendeel, het is het juiste om te doen. Enkel een politieke oplossing kan zorgen voor blijvende vrede en veiligheid in het Midden-Oosten. Ladies and gentlemen, our European project was born out of a devastating war. The darkest hours of our European history, marked by the Shoah, that led to moral insight and repentance. It provided Europe with a clear sense of direction, a duty also, a duty to support a democratic and free Ukraine against a war of aggression from Russia, a duty to help a path to lasting peace between Israel and Palestine, but above all, a duty to ourselves, to future generations, to pass on a Europe that is more free than the one that we live in today. And let us be clear, that is not self-evident. We see glimpses from those darkest hours in our societies today. We see today 
women's rights under pressure. We see the rights of minorities and of LGBTQI people curtailed. We see the return of fascist symbols in our streets and a rise of anti-Semitic violence. The fight against our demons never ends. It remains our most important task, most important task for all of us. Yet, you see a lot of young Europeans from all corners of our continent who are more than ever committed to a free Europe. A Europe where you can live where you want. A Europe where you can love who you want. A Europe where you can be who you want. These values, these values is what is at stake at the European ballot boxes in June. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a cause worth fighting for. I thank you. Thank you very much.